Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. The lieutenant governor in the state of Indiana wears many, many hats. He has this gray conservative businessman's hat that says director of the Department of Commerce. He has a straw hat that says commissioner of agriculture. He has one that says President of the Indiana Senate. I think that's a hard hat, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he has one on order, as all lieutenant governors do in the state of Indiana, that says uh, candidate for governor. He'll be trying that on in 1988. Our guest today is lieutenant governor of the state of Indiana, John Mutz, a successful businessman from Indianapolis, a former state senator. Glad to have him with us today. Also with us is John Rouse, producer of Public Affairs Roundtable and a member of the political science faculty at Ball State University. Governor, I mentioned you have a lot of roles and some legislators have even mentioned that perhaps too many. Maybe we should relieve you, or all lieutenant governors henceforth, of their duties as president of the Senate because he really doesn't have time to devote, devote his time to effectively do all these jobs. Do you agree with that or not? I suspect that the die was cast a long time ago in regard to this change. It doesn't affect me from a personal standpoint. Uh, uh, the constitutional amendment at the earliest would be effective in uh, 1992. So uh, my term of office wouldn't be affected in any way, but future lieutenant governors would be. And basically what happened back in 1971 was a historic meeting of what was the Republican caucus in the Senate. And at that time, they made the decision to strip the then lieutenant governor of all of his power to appoint committee chairman and to uh, assign bills to committees, which, of course, is the major prerogative of the chief officer of either the House or Senate. And they transferred that to the president pro tem at that time. And it has been in the hands of the president pro tem since then and will continue that way. Now, that was probably the big decision. Because all the lieutenant governor does now is formally preside over the Senate and vote in case, in case of ties. And what they're proposing to do now is to uh, uh, have their presiding officer be one of them, to use the lieutenant governor to vote in case of a tie when they organize the Senate, in case there happen to be 25 Republicans and 25 Democrats at that time. And, and so uh, I think the real decision was made in 1971. It's not going to be, it, that's what really affects what's happened here. So we, you, you can see it coming then that, in fact, you'll be relieved, or the lieutenant governor will be le relieved his duties of presiding officer of the state? Yes, I think it's likely that that will become part of the, the constitution of the state of Indiana. Okay. John Rouse. Uh, in this time of uh, effectiveness or an emphasis upon effect effectiveness in public institutions, whether it be state highways or the license branch system or education or mental health, the emphasis by politicians, meaning executives and legislators, is upon the in are upon the inputs. In other words, the chairs and the desk and the equipment and so forth. How are politicians? who have to make these key decisions going to be focusing upon the outputs in terms of what do the bald states do or the, or the highway department or the license branch. How can you come to grips with this very difficult issue of outputs, mm -hmm. finding out what we do? Mm -hmm. it's, it's probably because there are not r good ways, at least not presently, good ways to measure outputs in many of our endeavors in which government is involved that we have gone back to the other thing that can be quantitatively measured, you know, as you point out, number of people who report to you and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think with a little creativity that you can develop methods of measuring output. Let me give you an example. Let's say State Highway Department. For example, if you were to say uh, to one of the districts that does maintenance on the State Highway system, we're going to contract this with a private sector provider for a limited period of time. And then we're going to measure the cost of doing the job there per mile of highway required with the cost in some others. You begin then to apply some outside measures against what government does. In, in the debate right now about education, uh, one of the most important parts of that debate, and I would say the one thing that will either get it sold to the public or not, is the question of account accountability. And the public, I think, is willing to invest more in kids and in the kindergarten through high school program 
if they think there's going to be some measurable results. Now, measurable results normally have been in the past the standardized tests that we know. Uh, also, uh, uh, you can develop measures of the quality or knowledge of teachers in given fields and so forth. But the thing that we've endeavored to do recently is to come up with this uh, program for statewide testing, uh, a test that can be pretty much universally agreed upon by people in rural areas and people in urban areas and people with low achievers and high achievers and so forth. And then we can say to those uh, particular uh, teachers and kids, uh, at each interval of the process, we test you. If you haven't met the minimum requirements, then we're going to provide up to 85 hours of remedial training on reading, writing, and basic arithmetic. And then we'll test you again. And it's on the basis of those tests that we decide whether you move on to the next grade or not. In other words, the issue of social promotions uh, will, is a controversial one, but one that would, would be directly attacked in this particular program. And we would say to school corporations, you can promote people social if you want to, but you don't get paid for those students under the distribution formula from the state of Indiana. Now, that's the kind of accountability or measuring results that I think is possible as far as government is concerned. The same thing is true in the mental health field uh, and some of the other areas that we deliver services uh, as well. Uh, but you've got to be a little creative about how you come up with, with the measures. Let's pursue for a minute the education program that Governor Orr has proposed uh, that the legislature is considering right now. Um, if this remediation program, if Governor Orr's program is such a good idea, and of course this is always the question, why didn't we do it sooner? Mm -hmm. Well, because of the atmosphere achieve it with the public wasn't present sooner. You know, public officials don't just operate in a vacuum out here someplace in which they dream up ideas and then pronounce them as being good for people. These sorts of things have to come ultimately from a broad base of support. And what we are seeing now is a surprising number of Hoosiers who feel either they have been shortchanged in terms of what the education system gave them or they're afraid their kids will be shortchanged. But that's nuts and bolts, gut level sort of stuff. Because if you know that your quality of life and your ability to work in a, a good paying job is affected by this sort of thing, then it hits home because it hits the family pocketbook. So I'm suggesting to you that the awareness level of how important this educational issue is has not been near what it needs to be up until recently to achieve the sort of reforms and changes we're talking about. I think we're coming very close to the time when, you know, a high percentage of the population is willing to provide more resources to the education system if, in fact, we have measurable results. If, if I can follow up on that, uh, it seems to me that you have a very difficult task because, first of all, the permanent bureaucracy, meaning uh, manned by teachers and uh, influential, uh, of course, is ISTA, the Indiana State mm -hmm. Teachers Association, Number two, the clients, the pupils. It seems that both of those groups are reluctant to change and accept new ways of testing and new ways of being more accountable mm -hmm. to themselves and also others. How does the leadership of this state go about trying to convince the permanent bureaucracy, meaning the teachers, and also the clients, meaning the pupils, to change their habits? Well, change is a scary proposition for everybody. There's no question about it. I see it in in private businesses where they are telling a given employee your job description changes as of next week you know that's a very scary thing because the reason they're they're afraid is first of all they're not sure whether they can hack it or not whether they can do it and secondly uh, it's a lot easier to just do it the way we've always done it and I think obviously that, that the the obvious way to deal with the establishment as you call it in education uh, is to include them in all the deliberations and uh, include them in the planning, include them in the acceptance of the test and all that sort of thing. That's the most important part of that. But even then, you're going to have built-in re resistance to that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I guess uh, the thing that will do more than anything, in my opinion, is some of the initiatives that I see at uh, uh, several of the state universities, including Ball State, in which we are developing some research work, which in turn makes some determinations as to whether these things are good for kids or not. And 
ultimately, if they're good for kids, uh, most teachers are in teaching because they want to do what's good for kids. If I could follow up this quickly, is ISTA part of the problem or part of the solution? Well, there are individuals in organizations like this who are probably on both sides of that question. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it serves any useful purpose to try to single out an individual organization uh, and say, if you guys had only banned and moved, we could do this. Uh, it's going to require that on everybody's part. You served in the legislature. Uh, you know how deliberate this body can be from time to time. The, the legislature is pretty much chewing over the governor's education plan right now. Uh, for example, they're uh, making changes. Uh, perhaps we don't want to lengthen the school day, uh, school year by 10 days, as the governor has proposed. Various other proposals. You served even a Senate Finance, if I recall. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're familiar with sort of the budget considerations of the legislature. What are we going to get out of this legislature in terms of edu education reform, if we want to call it that? And how closely is this going to resemble the governor's program? Well, <clears throat> um, as a person who served in that body, both the House and Senate, for 13 years, and as chairman of the budget committee for six of those 13 years, and then of course I've been closely related to the process for the last six years, I know it's risky to make predictions at this point of the process. But I think we are on the brink of the most important education reform package we have seen in my lifetime. And I think it's very likely we'll get a program that is very similar to what the governor and Superintendent Dean Evans have, have asked for. Now, having said that, I've been a legislator uh, and involved in the process a long time, and it is a, a process of compromise. It is a process in which legislators like to have their own involvement in certain things that they have their own imprint on. That's part of the system. And so it won't be identical. But I think that you will see a program that very closely resembles it. And let me tell you why. The governor will veto any education funding program that does not include in it the accountability measures that we just talked about here. So if everybody really wants some of the other things, which everybody is agreed upon, you know, there's parts of this program that everybody says I like, superintendents, school board members, and ISTA like, but there are others that are controversial. If they want those things, they'll have to accept the accountability features. And the governor, I have, kn I have known Bob Orr as an individual, as a state senator and as an individual businessman for a long period of time. I have never seen a government with his heels, a governor, with his heels dug in deeper than he is at this moment. He believes so strongly in this situation. And uh, clearly, he's not running for another office. This is something he believes is important for the people of Indiana. And he intends to stick with it until it gets done. Certainly, that's the checks and balances system. Uh, but these things don't come cheaply. There is a price tag attached. And as you mentioned, you think the citizens of Indiana are prepared to provide the additional resources for an education program. Are, in fact, we going to have to sacrifice in other areas of the budget for this educational program? Or is the legislature going to find a way to increase a tax here or there to provide additional funding? I think we're going to have to sacrifice in other parts of the budget to bring this about. If we really believe this, and if we recognize that two-thirds of the state budget anyway goes to education, yes, there will be some sacrifices. If, if I could follow up with a question that is very much connected, and that focuses upon commerce, Mm -hmm. What kind of economy, uh, you have been very active in bringing new industries to the state. In the past, we've had a, the two major industries, of course, are, are automobiles and farming. What kind of economy are we going to have, say, in the next 15 years, by the year 2000, in terms of what kinds of economics are we going to bring to the state? Well, in the next uh, uh, 15 years, that is, by the year 2000 or approximately there, uh, Manufacturing will still be the dominant industry in the state. And I will predict that uh, while we have about 25% of our population in manufacturing, it will not decrease a great deal. We'll be in the 20 to 25% range of the workforce in manufacturing, higher than the national average. Secondly, those industries will largely locate in smaller communities. That's the dominant pattern right now. The services industries, and I'm talking now about telecommunications, transportation, uh, education, uh, medical, 
those things will center in the larger communities and provide those services on a mass basis to all the communities around them. That's the pattern we see emerging. Uh, steel will still be important in Indiana, believe it or not, by the year 2000. Uh, agriculture will be important only if we can find some ways to take advantage of the value-added opportunities. We can no longer afford just to be a producer of basic commodities, corn, soybeans, and so forth. We've got to add the value or the processing to those products in Indiana with Indiana people and with the Indiana tax base. If we do that, then agriculture will continue to be a very important force as far as the state is concerned. Those are some of the things I see happening. I think, I think the other thing that's going to happen is that uh, worker training will be more important than it's ever been. I'm not talking about basic education. I'm talking about after you get in the workforce. We're going to be retraining people every seven years or so. Uh, and industry is going to double the amount of money it spends on worker training. Last year, we estimate that they spent $385 million. We think it'll be close to $700 million in the state of Indiana per year for training workers. As Indiana government's uh, director of the economic development effort, uh, you were at the forefront of negotiations in, with the Isuzu people landing the, the plant that will be located near Lafayette. Uh, we had seen over a number of months some criticism of the administration for not having landed plants that ended up ultimately in Kentucky or Tennessee or Illinois. Was there a special kind of pressure on you, even though we had the new GM plant up near Fort Wayne? Was there a certain special kind of pressure, uh, political perhaps, for, uh, for Indiana to obtain one of these plants that, that seemed to be... Uh... Well, there was pressure from the press, but we have tried to resist that kind of pressure and continue to look at these deals on the basis of what makes good economic sense for the state. And so we do on the large projects a cost-benefit analysis. The cost-benefit analysis is related to how long does it take us to get the state's money back? How many state dollars go in? How many state dollars come back? Now in the case of the uh, 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 two big projects, the General Motors truck assembly plant uh, and the uh, uh, Fuji Azusu project in Tippecanoe County. Uh, the payback periods are a little different on these two, but uh, in both cases they are under eight years. We get, including the construction time. So, and then we double our money every six years thereafter. That's the kind of return on investment. Now, the states that beat us out for those Japanese plans in Illinois and Kentucky uh, both put more money on the table than we were willing to put on the table. We, we made it very clear that that's as far as we thought it was prudent to go, and we also made it very clear that if we're to justify what we do to the legislature and the taxpayers, that we've got to have a measurable return. The n negotiating tool that I found most helpful in this whole thing was, in fact, that economic analysis. I handed it to the Japanese about two months before they made their decision. I said, here's our analysis. You have your economists look at this. You tell me what's wrong with it. They came back and they were within $4 million of the estimate as to the amount of money involved going back and forth. So we were within, you know, 1% 1, 1 in terms of our agreement. Once that was done, it was a relatively easy negotiation because I, I made it very clear to them, you don't want to be embarrassed and we can't afford to offer you any more than what would be prudent in terms of the public's eye. Then it wouldn't have been in Indiana's interest to pay what Kentucky did for the Toyota plant or pay what Illinois did in terms of, of whatever for uh, uh, the Mitsubishi plant? In my opinion, both of those projects, the states in, spent more than we thought was prudent. Now, I can't tell you that it wasn't good for Kentucky or Illinois. That's a decision that the folks in those two states have to make. But if you took their package, put it on land in Indiana, we would not have gotten our money back in a period of 12 years in both cases. So I didn't think that was a good, good deal for the people of Indiana. If I could tie together the issues of commerce and also education, because they are interrelated. What is the private sector doing to promote better education? Because after all, the people who finish our school systems end up working for Indiana industries. Mm -hmm. What is the role of industry in focusing upon a better results education? Well, industry in some cases has gotten the message, and in other cases is just beginning to get the message about the importance of their trained workforce. Uh, it probably is the single most important resource that any business has, better than its technology, better than its product line, better than its patents. And th the fact is that uh, 
uh, still the percentage of Indiana businesses who, who recognize this and put it into practice is not as large as it needs to be. I indicated earlier that training money is going to increase substantially. Uh, this is not so much because we're going to be a high-tech uh, dominated uh, state. Uh, less than 6% of the whole U.S. population will be in what you call high-tech industries. But every industry that survives will use high technology to survive. And the way you make it work is with people who, who can use it, understand it. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is uh, upgrading the attainment levels of people in business and industry because we are behind in the state of Indiana in that respect. Uh, when I say attainment levels, I mean how many people have graduated from high school, how many have never even gone to high school. 17% of all people in manufacturing in Indiana never attained, went to one year of high school, one day of high school. So that begins to give you some idea of what that mix is like. So uh, business and industry uh, is coming very quickly into the uh, realization that uh, they're going to have to invest, as will the public sector in this sort of thing. Now, we're doing some innovative things. One of the things that's coming up in this session of the legislature is the development of what we call in-plant education. That would be a deal in which we made a joint venture arrangement between a basic industry. They would provide all the physical things necessary to deliver education, desks, chairs, rooms, laboratories, and so forth. The university then would agree to award the degrees, provide the credits for the courses, and the teaching instruction. They would negotiate a, a tuition between the two of them. We see a lot of that taking place. Literally, in selling Indiana to the Mitsubishis or the Isuzus or whomever, uh, there are a number of factors involved. As we said education is one of them, transportation, the labor force, uh, the tax structure of the state, uh, all these things, part of the mix of what Indiana is when you go to try to sell it, to bring somebody in, or perhaps more importantly, to keep industries here, to get them to expand within Indiana. What in this laundry list of things that, that make up Indiana, what it is in trying to sell it, uh, what's our biggest liability? What do we need to work on? One or two things that we really need to emphasize. I think the perception, and I emphasize perception because it's not always the reality, the perception of the adaptability of the, U of the Indiana labor force to new management techniques. Part of this is because we are looked upon as one of the states with older, more mature industries. And as a result, the assumption is made that our people can't adapt to new management techniques. Um, they also make the assumption that our wage rates are higher than some other parts of the country. And uh, in a few industries, they are. But generally speaking, we're very competitive on those factors. The perception of that climate there, it's the labor management climate in, in part that I'm talking about. That's the single biggest hurdle we have to go over with existing industry first and to some extent with, with new industry. But with existing industry, definitely, that is the, the single biggest hurdle. The, the grass isn't greener elsewhere. Uh, is, is that the message you give to existing industries? Well, on existing industries, uh, uh, my big problem there is convincing people in the existing companies that they're our number one priority. We spend more of our time and effort, almost 80 percent and almost 60 percent of all the money that is involved in our programs, on existing Indiana companies. If you go out and ask somebody on the street, they'd say, well, it's for these new ones you're bringing in, because that's where the publicity, that's where the headlines are. So the problem, first of all, is to get them to realize we've got a number of things available to help them. And then secondly, uh, is, uh, is to, to give, get them to give it an honest appraisal. And uh, in many cases, when you do that, it, we look good. Uh, we have had some situations where uh, uh, an existing labor agreement has foiled our attempts to get a new investment in Indiana. On the other hand, we've got some great examples of where a new labor agreement in Indiana made the difference as to why they came here rather than went to Ohio or Pennsylvania. I, I look at Connersville, Indiana, where Ford uh, did that uh, constructively. Uh, I, I look at Marion, Indiana, and Anderson, uh, both GM facilities there, where a creative labor agreement hammered out between the two made the difference in the investment decision. I, from a uh, historical point of view, Hoosiers have been very conservative on the issue of the lottery. What do you think the lottery will do for Indiana if it is indeed passed by the legislature, then passed by the public? Mm. Well, I think the lottery probably, in terms of what it will do for Indiana, has been grossly overblown in terms of all the attention given to it. As far as I'm concerned, it's a lifestyle question. Do the people of Indiana want that sort of activity 
in Indiana and do they want the proceeds of that activity going to Indiana government rather than the governments of Ohio or Illinois or someplace else? That's the issue as far as I'm concerned. But if you're counting on the lottery to solve the problems of funding education, or if you're planning on it to, found the, uh, to solve the problems of funding roads and highways, it's not going to do that because it will be an infinitesimal percentage of the total state budget. Uh, I have supported the, uh, the resolutions in the House and Senate uh, that allow the uh, uh, issue to be placed on the ballot and let the people decide whether they really want this kind of activity or not in the state of Indiana. Uh, but, but I think it's a, 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 a lifestyle question. And I would point out to you that also hinging on the lottery issue is whether or not paramutual betting on such things as horse racing is legal in Indiana as well, because that court case clearly stated the point that that issue hinges on this uh, question. Senator Craigcraft from Delaware County, uh, perhaps typical of a lot of legislators, says he personally opposes the lottery, but he will bend to the wishes of his constituency that we want it on the ballot so that we can decide and probably uh, to approve this uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, change in the Constitution. Is this government the way it's supposed to work, that even though a number of legislators might not see it as good public policy, they do bend to the will of, the, of what, what they see the will of the people? Well, there has to be some balance between your own personal convictions and the will of the people, as you call it. And if it is an issue that doesn't offend your moral sensitivities, that is something that's deeply rooted in your own view of how the world is and how it should be, which is a moral issue with you, then I think a legislator who is in a representative democracy does have some responsibility to give the people an opportunity to decide. I'd point out in Indiana that very few issues are decided by referendum. Very few. This is a, an, an exception because it's an amendment to the, con the Constitution. And I suspect a lot of politicians uh, uh, will uh, do just what uh, Ally Craycraft has done and, and uh, uh, say I, uh, uh, this is something the people should decide. Thank you, Governor. We're out of time today. Uh, our guest has been John Mutz, uh, Director of the Department of Commerce, Commissioner of Agriculture, President of the Senate, but uh, most importantly, uh, in company to all those, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Indiana. Thank you, Governor. Also with us today has been John Rouse, producer of Public Affairs Roundtable. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Bill Mosier and Mike Seaborg. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.